Good morning for, to everyone in Europe and good afternoon to everyone in China. Uh, this is Bruno Mizan from the EU SME Center and we're here again together for a new uh, webinar in our uh, webinar series at the EU SME Center. So you're all familiar, quite so, you're already quite familiar to our panel, but quick reintroduction, see if everything's running well. Uh, on your left hand side, you've got the hand. If you can hear us, please raise your hand so that we can actually check that you can all hear us. Um, and I'm not seeing many hands being raised now, gradually okay. Um, I'll try to see maybe it's because I'm not speaking close enough to the microphone, so let me speak a bit louder. Um, welcome to our webinar series. So again in our webinar panel, you've got another, a number of other uh, functions, you know, our questions uh, function, don't hesitate to use that one to actually uh, ask your questions during this webinar. Again, as usual, we have a number of participants at today's webinar, so we won't be able to take all the questions today, but we'll try to take as many as possible. In case we don't manage to take your uh, question, again, uh, please contact us by email at the bottom of this slide, or preferably log in uh, into our uh, website at usmecenter.org.cn. I'd like to remind a few of you, the few new ones of you that are participating to today's webinar of uh, who we are. So the center is an initiative financed by the European Union to support European SMEs to establish and develop commercial activities here in China. We do that through the provision of free and confidential information as well as advice on very practical questions that SMEs are facing uh, on their day-to-day -day business in China. Um, we answer a variety of questions on uh, business development, is there a mar market for your product, legal issues, um, uh, technical aspects, NHR uh, elements. We have to do that a number of uh, services and tools, in particular a number of uh, publications uh, from reports to guidelines uh, as well as a number of other services from the center which are all described on our website and in particular we provide training seminars on a number of uh, issues sectors and uh, which we try also to cover during uh, this webinar series. So after the success of the past editions we've uh, invited John Echanove again our uh, standards and conformity assessment uh, advisor to introduce us on how to get your products past Chinese customs. So with this I'd like to invite John and pass you uh, the mic to share again your experiences uh, and make this a, a happy uh, um, and, and successful exchange today. <laughs> Thank you very much Benoit. Um, actually the happy ending would be that we managed to convince everybody how to get the, the, the products through customs. Unfortunately, we won't be able to do that much. Um, but we will manage to do something at least a bit. Um, well, um, very briefly, just I don't want to bother you with, with details, but basically my background is on the standardization. I work for the Electrotechnical Standardization Committee for many years as director and I was there in, in charge with uh, negotiation with the Chinese authorities on, on standardization, conformity assessment and other market access issues. And, and also maybe relevant is I have my own company, I have set up here in China, so I have suffered myself the uncertainties of being in, uh, an entrepreneur in, in the Chinese market. Um, now. What we want to do today, what is that part about accessing the Chinese market that we're going to focus on? Well, we're going to basically talk about the main administrative issues that you will face uh, in general terms. And one of the things that we want to uh, bring light to it is uh, what's the role of Chinese standards um, compared to what you would find in Europe? Um, what are other import formalities that you may have to uh, deal with and is there any way where I can find those uh, import formalities or standards that is reliable um, and then go through, through help you how to do it. Now, um, besides that, what are the conformity assessment schemes? What are the main um, schemes that you will find when trying to 
bring your products into the Chinese market and what are the key messages we would love you take away both from what conformity assessment is about in China and what about the regulations um, uh, for, for, as, as, for importers. And on that we, we, we are already going to start gauging how much you really know about standards uh, in China. I'm going to open the first poll which will appear to you in a few uh, seconds. So um, have a look at, uh, at the poll, try to get us some of your feedback. The question is on, on whether the standards in China are all mandatory, B, they're all voluntary like European standards, C, some are mandatory and some are voluntary, and D, most Chinese standards are equivalent to international or European standards. So I see your answers coming in. Um, we're giving you a few more, more seconds to, uh, to answer. And with this, I'm closing uh, the poll and I'm sharing, sharing with you uh, the results. So that's quite interesting results, John. You can see 62% uh, which, uh, which, which believe that some are mandatory and some are voluntary. But that's wonderful. That means that this is the first time that we run the, the, the webinar. So people eventually got the message. Yes, some standards are voluntary, some are mandatory. And I'm also quite happy to see that there are two percentages that are low, uh, about the all, my, all uh, voluntary, like European standards, and, and also very low that most Chinese standards are equivalent to international ones, because those two are not the case. And, and that would be probably one of the two things that if you believe they are right, you may uh, face some problems in your in accessing your market, your products into the market. If you believe that they're all mandatory, well, you will overdo it, but that's better than believing that they're all voluntary, definitely. Um, well, at least they won't have any uh, surprises and they will be careful about, about the work to be done. That's, so right, that's right. Maybe some good news for 30% of our attendees today. Exactly. So <laughs> I'm hiding the answers and I let John to continue with his presentation. Yep. Um, Thank you, Benoit. Um, in, in general terms, and that probably is not different from any other market in the world, what, what, what do I have to do as a small company, a small manufacturer, if I want to, to place my products under the Chinese market? Well, first thing I have to look at what are the legal requirements. Is, is my product allowed in this market or not? Um, and if yes, well, what does it mean? How this requirements are described. Maybe I have to, to certify my products, maybe I have to find a license, uh, maybe there's a particular label in, I have to find out what, 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 what those requirements are. And if those requirements are there, then from a technical point of view, what do I have to do? And that is where Chinese standards are. What are those standards that's where right, Chinese standards from a point of view what to do? And then, most probably, if there is a need for uh, a third party conf confirming that I am in line with legislation, where do I do that? How do I, how do I do, how do I do my testing? How do I do my conformity assessment? And where do I do it? And maybe a last step is many products in China will suffer commodity inspection. They will have particular test methods done by the authorities. Do I know those test methods? There will be any differences. Um, and when I have gone through all that, then my product will get into China. Now, the, the first step then um, would be to identify what are those requirements that, that I have to comply with, even before dealing with the technical part of it. And, for those who are in Europe, actually the European Commission has uh, a marvelous tool, and, and that is the Market Access Database. Hmm? Now, here you have the link to that, and you will be able to access it if, if you are in Europe. And, and it will help you identify for many markets, China included, what are the tariffs they're going to face, what are the procedures and formalities, some statistics per market, what are the trade barriers that other or previous uh, exporters have 
faced in these markets and, and some data on uh, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, elements. Now we are, um, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but we have included some snapshots of the market access database so you can see uh, what is the kind of information that you will get and how that connects later with the other elements of that chain that we have shown. Um, that is the main page of the market access database. That's what you're going to face when you log in into this, the, the, um, the, the address that we have uh, given you in the previous slide. And if you're looking at um, getting your product into the market from a technical point of view, what you would be looking at is to click on procedures and formalities. Um, and, and if you do so, then you will have to select the country, which in this case, you just click there and select China, and then you will have to look for your product. Um, if you click on find the care, then you will have the possibility of a, a pop-up menu where you can just type the name of your product and search. And imagine that in this case, we're looking for lamps, we click lamps, we search and give us all the different um, all the different codes, HS codes, that are related to lamps. Once we select the one that we're looking for, imagine that is the product code 9405, which is lamps and lighting fitted included in, 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 in furniture. Um, then you will see the different elements that are related to the product. You will have a, what they call an country overview, and that is general information about China, about main elements of the Chinese market that are actually very well developed. So if you actually, if you want to know something about China, a country overview is a good, is, is a good start. Then you have a general requirements. These are documents of international trade. Nothing new, there's a thing that you have to have when you go, uh, when you do international trade. And there's a third column which are the specific requirements. Uh, and those are possible, or some of them you will have to click to verify if they are, uh, if they are only for a specific element of the product or for all the products that you will have to comply with. And in this case, uh, there are uh, three of them that you will definitely have to, which is that you will have a commodity inspection certificate. That means that when your product arrives to uh, to port here in China, a CIQ, which is the administration in China in charge of community inspection, will test your product. Uh, you have to certify your product with a China compulsory certification, and you will have to issue a declaration of conformity. Um, if you're dealing with used uh, equipment, then you will have to follow one of the two certificates. Now, that would be the first step that you're looking for it which is, okay, now what I know is that there has to be um, a certificate, so I have to certify my product, meaning that there has to be some technical requirements associated to that. Uh, there will be a commodity inspection, and again, there will be mandatory standards, and therefore there has to be a declaration of conformity that I declare my product is compliant with certain laws and, uh, and standards. And that's the second step. Now, it is important from, from those of us who are used to the business in Europe and use European standards to acknowledge that the Chinese system is different. And in Europe, you will only find European standards. The end, in China, you will find four different levels. And you may be unlucky, and your brother has to comply with more than one of the levels. Um, for most of these levels, you will find that the standards are either voluntary or mandatory. And, and that applies both national, professional, and local. Now we will go slightly um, more in depth, um, but basically national standards are developed by the National Standardization Body, which is SIC. Uh, professional standards are developed by different ministries that have a mandate on, in particular sectors. 
uh, local standards are of the provinces, and this is the CIQ, the, um, the branches of the uh, quarantine administration uh, in China that is in charge of it. And you may have local, uh, sorry, enterprise standards that are done by, by businesses. Hmm. Now, what about national standards? Well, as the name says, national standards are standards that apply to the whole country. And they are not different in in also in what it is um, um, European standards. Hmm? Um, they have a strong focus on safety and quality, and that's what they're trying to regulate. It depends on the sector. You will find that national standards, or what we call GBS standards, um, are in line or are equivalent to international standards. But that's not an overall rule. Um, the way for you to know if a standard, a mandatory standard is, sorry, if a GB standard is mandatory or not, is in the code. Um, a code that says GB and then the name of the, and the number of the standard is a mandatory standard. If your standard says GB slash T and then the number, then you're dealing with a voluntary national standards. If it has slash set, then it's a guiding document, and therefore by itself, it's by, by default, it's a voluntary document. Mm -hmm. um, the second level is professional standards. Now, very important um, to know, even if national standards from a hierarchical point of view are more important than professional standards, uh, it doesn't mean that if there are national standards related to one product, that you will not have professional standards. Now, the, if a national standard regulates one particular aspect of a product, and there is a standard for them, a national standard, then you will not find a professional standard. But it's quite common that you have national standards regulating a part of the product, and you will have professional standards regulating other elements of the product. Hmm? Um, those standards are sector driven and ministry driven. You will, you will see that, you can see there in the screen that, the, that depending on the sector, they have a different code and a different administration dealing with it. For example, you can find Texas, which is F set. Hmm? Um, you will find communication, U2, machinery, UB, etc., etc. Hmm? Now, this is probably one of the most cumbersome problems of the Chinese standardization because finding and looking for national standards is relatively easy and it's a centralized system as it is the European standards. Professional standards are not centralized. As I said, they are developed by the different ministries and therefore you will have to navigate through the different administration to identify where and who develops those standards and what are those standards that are valid for your product. As it happens with national standards, you have mandatory ones uh, where you have the code and the number, as in the national standards, if you have a slash T, then uh, we're talking about voluntary standards. Um, and finally, uh, local and enterprise standards. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on them. Uh, local standards, you may have a situation where you also have uh, um, mandatory or voluntary standards, um, but on the overall it's quite unlikely that, that you will find that. At least in my experience, if you manage to find your national standards and your professional standards, you're already quite okay. Now, from a practical point of view, where do I find those standards? Where do I have to look for it? Well, you have two ways of doing it. Well, you have more than two, we're sure, but there are two let's say, official ways of doing it. The first one is the National Standardization Body, which is SAC, and there you have the link, where you can find all the GBA standards, all the national standards, and you can search for it in English. Now, of course, you will have quite a lot of information in Chinese, but you are, you're quite okay searching by name, number, even for ICS code, which is the International uh, code for standardization. Um, I 
even if you can't search in English, I would recommend that you look, if you can, uh, that you search in Chinese because not, not always translations are, are, are well done. Mm -hmm. Now the other search tool that we're offering you is um, a database uh, done by CNIS, which is one of the organizations which is the Chinese uh, National Institute for Standardization, mm -hmm. and that's the link which in principle is a database of all available standards. Now, if you search there, you will find not only national, Chinese national standards, you may also find European standards, BSI standards, DIN standards, but what is important is that you can find uh, professional standards. Now, to identify professional standards, you have to go back to the previous slide and and identify with the code what are those professional standards listed in that search tool. Um, you may use English. Uh, I recommend to do it in Chinese. The SAC, the national, looking for GB standards in English is more or less reliable. The database for professional standards, it's, it's much more reliable if you follow and you do the search in, English, in, in Chinese, sorry. I think there there is already a number of questions and some questions that we we have quite frequently actually it's just it's quite a difficult one but as a as a rule of thumb for companies to understand how much they have to adapt here what is the percentage roughly you you think of these standards which are similar to to international or European standards? Mm. Yes, well, uh, yeah. Th th thanks, Benoit. That's that's a question we we have very often in the inquiry service of the SME Center. It really varies a lot. Uh, there are sectors like the uh, electrotechnical sector where you will find uh, a, a very big effort to bring in international standards. Uh, there are other sectors, uh, maybe some I I ICT, where there is a lot of national standards as such. Um, there is no one route, one explanation for all the sectors. Um, of course, those sectors with an ex high export ratio and they are they would have more um, equivalence with, with international standards. Those strategic industries for the Chinese government will have less. There's another element though that it's important. Uh, sometimes you will find that even if they are doing an effort to implement international standards, they are not implementing the last versions of it. And that is, for example, is one of the typical examples with medical devices, SFDA has really the interest and, and, and the will to have international standards um, as their, in that case, professional standards. Um, but not always they are using the last versions of international standards and therefore they constitute a, a technical barrier to trade and voluntary technical barrier to trade. So quite important to, um, to, to inform yourself quite, quite uh, properly and in advance on that. I have two questions here which, uh, which have been referred and which are useful for, for, the, for the tools which you've just presented. The first one is related to the market access database asking, there is a user which is asking why he doesn't manage to actually access to it. Mm -hmm. And the second one is uh, specifically on, the, um, on the, um, the standards databases in China and to know a little bit more about how really they are useful or, 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 or not. Okay. Um, for, for the first one, the, the I guess that if a person cannot access the market, as, uh, market access database of the European Commission is because he or she is not based in Europe. Mm -hmm. You will only be able to access the database if, your, uh, if, if the OIP of your computer is, is, is in Europe. So for example from China we can't do it. Um, the, the other one about the reliability and user friendliness of, of, the, um, of these search tools. Um, well, it is the, I'm absolutely sure that the, for example, the SAC search tool is, is very reliable and accurate. Um, they put a lot of effort to, to, to be up to date. Um, is, is it user friendly? It, as, as many tools with the standards, is user friendly if you know what you're looking for. Uh, it's much more difficult if you have no idea exactly what you're looking for to find out the whole scope of the standards. Now, people that are familiar with, with their products and with the standards they normally use uh, will find it easier. 
Um, the, the other database, the CSNS, personally I think it's reliable. It's, it's, a, it's a governmental body who is doing it. But it's a huge database um, and things in China change quite fast. So um, you, you will still, I would recommend to do a double check with, with, with a service provider to make sure that you're covering all the elements. Um, there's something, I mean, about reliability, that there, something else for some of the sectors that might be helpful, and is that the European Commission and SSE tried to work together in facilitating precisely that access of the standards. I mean, um, and they created a platform, which is the EU China standardization platform. You have the link there. And it's aiming actually at making it easier to figure out what, what it is, what are the standards applicable, and you can search the sector, et cetera, et cetera. Now, so far, um, there are only four sectors there, electrical equipment, medical devices, mach machinery, and environmental protection. Um, the, that, the, the, the tool also has an overall information of the market and how to access the standards, how to buy them, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and also some description of the particularities of these four sectors compared to the international world. Um, so if someone of, of the audience, the participants today, um, has products in those sectors, I highly recommend to go there, check the information and the PDFs of the different sectors. Um, well, just as a reminder, um, depending on the sector, you can go to the EU China Standards Platform, which is uh, sponsored both by the uh, European Commission and SAC. Uh, you can just log on to the uh, SAC webpage, or you can check in the CNIS, which is CCN uh, webpage for the rest of the standards, but in particular for you to search for international standards. Mm -hmm. um, now, there is a second element that it's important to know when accessing your market, and one is when you find the technical requirements, um, which sometimes will lead to certification, but there is something that is important in China which are labeling requirements. And, and many, many of the products, you will find that besides any technical requirements, you have to label in a particular way. Um, and they vary and they change from product to product. So there's no one consistent law about labeling or what should be included. Um, you will find to find you will have to find what, what those requirements are. Something that is an advantage, um, bear in mind that this labeling of course has to be in Chinese, is that there is a way to register and get approval of your labeling before your product comes to China. And this is an on online system installed by CIQ. Um, so if you are thinking on exporting food, uh, well, be aware that you can have your label designed, send it in advance to make sure that when your products arrive to port, they don't have to be waiting for two weeks, three weeks before your labeling requirements are approved. Mm -hmm. And once they are approved, once your products are on the port, on the, on the customs chart, then you will have to place them on, on every uh, product or on every package. Some of the products that you will find labeling requirements, definitely food and beverages, and you will have then a range of different regulations, depending if you're talking about alcoholic uh, beverages or you're talking about uh, health food or, or baby formula, each of them will have a different requirements. Eh? Um, food additives, uh, volumes, etc., etc. Cosmetics also has a regulation for a specific regulation for labeling requirements, including the, com the, the composition and, and, and the formula of the product. Uh, textile is another area where you will have mandatory requirements on the materials and the, on the, uh, and the chemicals used on, on the dyeing, and, and, and that will be different from uh, European standards. And definitely electronic appliance where you will have uh, energy efficiency labeling or, uh, or, or the ROS elements of hazardous substances that you will have to apply if it's, and if it's the case. Some ele practical elements on labeling requirements. Um, well, uh, you can get 
uh, this important uh, pre-approval of the um, of your label uh, before you, you engage in the shipping or arrive. Uh, um, and that will be approved by, by CIQ. Um, in terms of cost, that will change very much. Uh, there will be a percentage, there will be a fee uh, for the printing and for the approval, but that will definitely change from the product uh, that we're talking is difficult to uh, give you one figure uh, for, for all of them. A suggestion and uh, something that we identify as best practices is check with your importer or the agent. They are the ones familiar with the labels, they are familiar with how to get approved. Um, just check with them before uh, you do the shipping, even before you send them to CIQ. Hmm? Okay, here it would be again quite quite useful actually to, to gauge again the uh, knowledge of our audience after all you've been introducing to us, John. So I'm going to launch the, the second poll which should appear on your screen right now, um, asking you whether, um, <clears throat> whether certificates from European certification bodies can or not uh, be uh, used to prove conformity in China. And the answers are A, yes, if the standards are equivalent, B, no, even if the standards are equivalent, C, only some test results are accepted if part of the IECCB scheme, and D, that was a difficult one, John, <laughs> and D, yes, if the certification body also has an office in China. So we're, we're getting some answers there. You can already start maybe giving us your, your impression, John. I think it's quite interesting, as usual. And I'm going to now close and also share uh, the results with everyone. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, again, um, re results are, are, are quite accurate. Um, yes, the, 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 the main answer is no. Uh, even if there are standards equivalent in China, you still have to go through a conformity here. Um, there is, though, uh, a very small proportion of products where, um, where you will, the Chinese test houses and certification body will accept your test results somewhere else, but that's a minor part of it, it's marginal. Um, and, 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 and no to the first one, it's, even if the standards are equivalent, the, 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 you still have to do this conformity assessment here, certification here. Um, so in general, well, let's see that. Uh, that's a 70, 80 percent of the people are more or less on the good, on the good track. So no, no easy tracks here. No easy tracks. No, unfortunately, not. That's one of the things that we're going to see precisely now when we move into conformity assessment and 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 what are the things you, sh what are the key messages about conformity assessment. Um, the, um, there is one certification, there is one mark which is the most known and, 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 and the one that covers a wider range of products which is the CCC mark, um, which is a mandatory mark. Um, now, something important to know is that all the CCC system is based on GB national standards. So that's a good cue because if your product is within the list of the products that require CCC and you have and you find in your database in whatever it is of the ones we have shown that there is a mandatory GB, the chances that you have to go through a CCC certification are very high. Hmm? Um, now, the how can you know if your brother requires a CCC? Well, one of the, one of the things to, to look at is are the mandatory standards. Uh, or the root of it is Chinese Customs issued every, issues every year an eight, a book, which is the Chinese Customs Handbook, where, where you have all the products classified by HS code, and they identify which product requires CCC. Uh, of course, in order to do that, you have to be in China to buy it. But maybe you can find someone to ship it to you. It's quite a heavy book. Um, 
but there's an easier way uh, for us, and is that you can uh, look at the cnca.ca.gov.cn webpage, which is the Chinese Certification um, and Accreditation Authority. This body is responsible for the uh, drafting of guidelines for the uh, CCC and for the if for the certification as such. Now if you if you go to the web page, the link we have given you, you will find a list of the implementing rules for every single category that requires CCC. And you will find it in English. So actually uh, identifying whether your product requires or not a CCC is is not that difficult. It's, probably much easier than finding the standards applicable to that. And you have on the screen the products. Um, in, 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 there are many, many elements that correlate with, with many of the directors from Europe, but you, the products move from electrical wires to latex products, medical devices, electric tools, etc., etc. Now, the CCC will look something like that. And what you are actually looking at is a, is a safety mark, essentially. Um, so most of the cases you will have a CCC with an S that is saying my product is safe. In the case of electrical products, you will have also uh, an element of quality saying my product doesn't disturb the others and therefore it's okay from the electromagnetic point of view. Maybe a CCC that combines both and there is one that is uh, for, for fire. Hmm? And so if I understand well, John, once I've got my CCC uh, on my product, it's fine. I can put my product on the market to pass customs. Well, uh, yes, if CCC is the only requirement for your product. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the challenges of China is that, um, as I've said before, there are labeling requirements that you will have to comply with that are mandatory. In the case, for example, of, of household appliances, there will have to be an, a mandatory energy efficiency labeling or rules. Um, but there are also, and that's one of the challenges, that you will have different certifications that you will have to apply for it or different licensing products. And one of the examples, for example, would be medical devices many of the medical devices will have to be certified with CCC and still will have to be registered within SFDA um, before you can even think of, of, of exporting. Um, and just one example, uh, I'm going to bring two examples. One is on the electrotechnical product, the other one is on the food, and just to see that whether CCC is enough or not. And for example, Three of the main market access schemes you will find in electrotechnical products are the famous CCC, but maybe you have also the network access license related to that, or maybe you need a, a radio type uh, emitting equipment approval. And we found, uh, not myself, but someone in the SME Center found an example to demonstrate how complex things can be. And, and, and this, is, uh, this is a device which is actually a boiler, uh, or not, not the boiler, this device is associated to a boiler and to my mobile phone. So if I'm driving back home and I want the heating system to start, I phone this device and by me phoning it, it will start boiling water and heat my, uh, either the apartment or just preparing the water for having a warm shower. Now, what it means, is means that uh, this device is connected wireless to the boiler, so there's a wireless connection. It's a remote communication because I do it via my phone. It's energy, energy consuming and it is plugged into the network and it has an interface with the, with the boiler. Now, from a market access point of view, you will definitely have a CCC certification because we're talking about electrical equipment. You will have a license for the remote communication, SRRC license. Um, so you will have a license for accessing the wireless, uh, the network, and you will have a special equipment license because you're dealing with a boiler, and you will have to deal with different administrations to get this done. It will not happen only in one. 
So you will have some time to work on your product before accessing. Um, and you will have some duplications in the process. The other, the other example that we wanted to bring in terms of market access is, is one that is quite popular in the USME Center and is food and beverages. And um, by the way, we will have a, a dedicated webinar on that on the 26th of, of February uh, about the food sector at large and what are the things and the, the elements that we can bring in. Um, but basically, what you will have uh, is is a range of different requirements depending on how dangerous is your product. If it's if it's live animals from said food, then it's considered very dangerous. And then countries may need a, a bilateral agreement uh, and agree on a health certificate. And then maybe they have to approve which establishments are allowed to export. And maybe depending on the product, other ministries have to be involved to agree on that. For example, we were talking about animal feed. Now, all this process may last for even seven years before governments are okay in exchanging food. So sometimes we receive inquiries from people saying, can I export pork, I have a, a, a frozen carcasses, and if the agreement is not there, it's even useless trying to start selling it. It's, it's a work for the national authorities to work on that. On the other end, the less dangerous products, we have technical requirements. Um, Prepackaged food. So, where actually the only thing you have to do is to make sure that your product complies with the technical elements that the product requires and the labeling requirements. Sometimes there are very uh, minor changes. I just recall now uh, chocolate that is exactly the same standards that in Europe, except that the the, the amount of scoop, the scooper allowed is is slightly different. And if you want to know more about the labeling requirements and so on, you could you could just uh, follow the link which has a report developed by the USME Center on, on how to do it. Um, I've, I've got a quick question on the on the process of uh, of uh, exports, John. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I've, I've heard recently that now all the exporters uh, need to actually be registered to put products in China and, and is that true only for the food and beverage or is that true for all sectors? Um, well, I, the, the, there is from October 2012, there is uh, an obligation to for every exporter to be registered online uh, on, on, on a particular website of AQSAQ. Um, the, the, the food safety law has always mentioned that you had to do that, but it has only been implemented, and that's law from 2009, it has only been implemented now. And now it has to, um, irrespectively of your product. You have to do it. You have to register uh, there, and the, the, the thing is that you also have to indicate there the data of the importer, who is receiving the products in China, so they can be contacted by the national authorities. Um, and again, on, on February we'll, we will show a little bit more about about the process. Okay, maybe maybe we can go through the next. Uh, maybe we've gone through quite a bit of content now. Now, John, it would be good if you can yes. uh, give us some 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 hints or some summaries also to remind us of what is actually the most essential. <laughs> Uh, well, there are some elements that are important from conformity assessment because at the end of the day, uh, what I want to do as an SME is not to know the technical requirements, is not to know the law. The thing I want to do is to make sure that my product is eligible to get into the market. And, and in that sense, there are some tips that we should all know. Um, the first one is that legal requirements, unlike Europe, will be set up in the standards, so therefore you have to be looking for them. Um, now, uh, conformity assessment will, be that for, uh, will require a testing house in China um, that very unlikely you will be able to use the test results to, to prove conformity. Um, if we're talking about CCC, there will be a factory inspection. So therefore, it's not only that will, your product has to be certified, but it has to be certified. Uh, in, in, in China and and that you will have to follow 
designated certification bodies and test houses are created by Chinese authorities and they're only those here in China. Um, if you have any, if, if you have any doubts on how to found those, uh, uh, this the Chinese accreditation body has a website in English where you can find who uh, who those are. Um, as a general remark, the Chinese system is the opposite of the EU presumption of conformity. Uh, it takes for granted that you may be cheating, and therefore everything has to be inspected before you get into the market unlike in Europe where you have just to get your products in the market and you're liable for lying. Um, three things to take away. Administratively, it's difficult to get to China, but it's not impossible. The thing that, it, the, 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 the thing that we ask you is to take your time. Take your time to investigate what do you need. Share experiences. Don't rush it. And once you get into China, this is a huge dynamic market. So make sure that you do it right for the first time. Maybe you need help. Maybe you need someone who has the knowledge on the technical elements uh, before uh, that can give you the, the, the necessary things for you to get through, particularly if it's the first time you, you get into China. Obviously, if you have Chinese uh, capacities in-house, that would be a great asset because you will be able to navigate to m many of the uh, administ Chinese administration web pages where even if they have information in English uh, that's limited. Most of the information and detailed information is only in Chinese. Thank you. Thank you very much John. Wonderful. Lots of food for thought. Lots of good answers and perspectives from the polls. Um, I'm very happy with, with the result of this webinar and actually we do have still quite some time to answer a number of uh, questions and uh, of your questions. We've actually taken some down. Um, we, we'll be a bit short on time, so we won't be able to take all of them. But let me just address you a couple of questions already. Maybe John, there is um, there is here uh, one question from a, a gentleman asking whether it's it's a good practice and if if it's useful to actually first send a sample of of their product to China to the market so as to just probably ensure that everything's fine before they send the whole shipment. Uh, um, in, in, in general, yes. Uh, actually, from a technical point of view, that will give you, from a technical point of view, it will give you the information you need. Um, but uh, possibly, it's even better practices to send a small shipment, because then you will not only gather information on the technical part of it, the, the content of your product, imagine that is uh, wine, whether it, it's okay, the labeling is okay, the, 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 the content, the, the, the composition is okay, but most importantly, you will have the experience of going through the whole process of customs. So maybe if you can't afford having sending a small shipment, is better than just a sample. Okay, that's um, that's again a, a good thing to note. I'm 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 asking you maybe a second question here that we have on on whether it's actually the importer which has to deal with with. The, all these questions that we've been discussing over the last 45 minutes or if it's really the responsibility for the European manufacturer and exporter to, to take care of this procedure and I think it, the answer is quite quite obvious but it's uh, it, it's probably good to share this uh, your, your ideas yeah. here again. Well, the, the thing is that the responsibility will also will always be you as, as, as the one that's producing the product who can guarantee that your product complies with, with the standard, that complies with the legislation um, what, what I was saying is that the local importers have the knowledge of, of what is acceptable and what is not. And, and, and that is a, a good way to double check what you have to do as a manufacturer to make sure that your product goes through customs. But at the end of the day, the one that is putting the risk, the one that is, is, is doing the product and the shipping it is a manufacturer and is the one that, is, is, that only has the knowledge of what the product really is about. Hmm? and whether the product complies or not with the legislation. What you have to know is what is that legislation about and what are those certificates that you have to comply with and that information can be provided by the importer. Thank you, John. Actually, we, we do still have a number of questions, but we've, we've almost reached our time limit and we'd like to also uh, share some, uh, some updates of the center with you. Um, so before that, I'd, I'd like to thank you, John, again for your, your intervention, sharing your experience. Uh, and making this all a, a, 
an easier and, uh, and more accessible procedure for uh, our European SMEs. Now, I'd like to, um, to just share with you, uh, as this is an opportunity to, uh, to um, raise visibility on one of the latest tools that we've developed at the center. It's uh, um, a tool we've called the Are You Ready for China Diagnostic Kit. Um, the kit is made from different elements, and, and the, the reason for us to develop this, uh, this, this uh, diagnostic kit was really done on the basis that we saw that there is a certain bias from the perspective of different SMEs on, on entering the Chinese market, some uh, believing that the market is so huge that there is a, an opportunity for anyone without uh, much uh, preparation, if at all, um, and other SMEs which uh, find it from start to be a too complicated market and decide not to uh, not to go for it. And, and indeed, a lot of SMEs sometimes have a misconception of, of the market, maybe not enough preparation for uh, the Chinese market, which requires a certain amount of uh, investment, certainly more than uh, exporting in, in Western countries, um, and maybe also sometimes a lack of, of uh, experience in uh, internationalization. And, and as mentioned, China is not a good market, but what we're trying to fill uh, with the products that we've, or with the new publications we have here, are to try to close the gap between uh, these two biased approaches and to really provide a tool for SMEs to, one, uh, identify where they stand really uh, when it comes to uh, their preparation to the Chinese market. So for that we have an electronic kit, which is uh, really the diagnostic kit, which you can find on our website. Um, it really provides you an opportunity to assess yourself on how much you know about the market have you prepared? Is there a market for your product? Have you done your research? Is there what, is, what are your clients? Which is your competition? Where do you want to go on the market? Uh, what are your expectations, uh, your planning, your financial planning? And finally, what have you done already? And uh, the toolkit, the diagnostic kit really provides you uh, with an overview of where you stand or where we stand, uh, where we believe you stand with, uh, with on the basis of your knowledge. But more important than that, it really provides you a list of further references, a tailor-made guidebook, if you will, uh, that takes you to the next level to make sure that you know about uh, some of the aspects you might forget about and make sure that, that you get the right information to understand those. So there is a, in, in addition to this general uh, diagnostic kit, there are uh, a number of other specialized questionnaires, but most importantly, in addition to the uh, electronic toolkit, we've also published uh, four uh, specific reports which are going to be useful to really uh, most, if not all, SMEs that want to do business in China. It's focusing uh, on general aspects, first of all, of its China on your radar, uh, the ways to enter the market, uh, the technical aspects of importing goods, services, and technology on the Chinese market, and finally, uh, how to assess and know your Chinese partner. I'm not going to go into much more details of these studies, but I would certainly like to invite you uh, uh, to, and, well, the reports and, and uh, electronic uh, tools, to invite you to actually visit the website and have access to them, gauge your own knowledge of the, of the, uh, of how to do business in China, where you stand, and uh, have access to more information, including these four uh, reports, to make sure that you're, you're successful in your uh, business dealings on this market. So you have the link there at the bottom of the page. It's just easier if you actually go on the website, usmecenter.org.cn, and you go to the, our Knowledge Center and click Diagnostic Kit. So I hope that uh, the, the publications and the tools like today's webinars continue to be of support to you. Um, and of course, we always welcome your uh, feedback on uh, these interventions and our uh, work uh, in general. So after this webinar, you'll have uh, access to a short survey. It'd be, uh, we'd very much appreciate if you can take two minutes of your time to actually uh, provide us with your feedback. 
If we haven't managed to uh, get back to you uh, on, your, on your question, we'd like to invite you to again send it through to us by email or preferably, as mentioned, to log into your account on uh, usmecenter.org.cn and post your uh, question to uh, our standards experts or other sectors if relevant. So with this again, John and everyone, thanks for your participation, you for the much. intervention. And uh, well, we'd like also to wish you uh, happy Chinese New Year, which is taking place next week. So we won't have a webinar next week, uh, next Tuesday, but we'll be we'll be following up the week just after that with, with new exciting topics, including on uh, um, import, well exporting of uh, uh, products in the food and beverage sector to China, uh, digital marketing, uh, uh, and so forth. So the list will be shared with you again. Uh, shortly and you can already register for some of them through our newsletter. So with this, thanks again. We we'll see you next time at our next webinar and Chinje Kwaila. Happy Happy Chinese New Year. Bye everyone. Bye bye.